I'm Mary Rose, author of the Inquiring Minds interviews on California Catholic Daily, talking with Father Joseph Ilo, pastor of Star of the Sea Parish in San Francisco, about his July 29th blog, Reacting to Blasphemy. Father Ilo's blogs can be found at fatherilo.blog.com. And you use the word blasphemy in your title. I don't know that you use the word blasphemy at all in the, the blog itself. But what is the church's definition of blasphemy? Blasphemy, I should read it from the Catechism of the Catholic Church <laughs> for all of our listeners to the Catechism for precision. But uh, off the cuff, I would say blasphemy is defined as mocking God or the things of God, taking his sacred name in vain in, in an um, irreverent manner or, or um, a sacrilegious manner. Okay. And so that's what happened. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, so in your blog, you talk a lot about violating um, human respect and being disrespectful of people. You also say it's disrespectful to God. But is offending people really that big of a deal, even if you're offending Christians. Is Christians being offended, is that bad on its own? Or is it only because God is being offended? Is that? Well, certainly the worst, the worse, more offensive, the more grievous offense is mocking God, is offending God. Our Lady of Fatima in one of the prayers said something like, make your reparation for God's majesty, which is so grievously offended by outrages and sacrileges. So there's really, in a sense, no degree comparison between mocking a person and mocking God, except insofar as the person, the human person is made in the image of God, or is a holy person by consecration, therefore, um, a channel of God's grace, and you're really mocking God when you mock someone of God. Mocking a, another person is also offensive, but but of a different, certainly a different degree, maybe a, a different kind of offense. But it's also a sin to needlessly offend somebody, to mock somebody. I mean, I think it's always a it's always a sin to mock somebody. It's not always a sin to offend somebody because the offense might be on their part, a reaction to a necessary and just correction. But in this case, the, uh, the essential crime was to offend God, to portray the Last Supper in a mocking way, and really to mock God's plan for sexuality and marriage. You know, the. Olympics opening ceremonies, artistic director apparently as a, as a gay activist. And so sexuality is how he defines himself. You know, gay is all about sex. So he no doubt wanted to mock the Christian understanding of sex, of, of, of human sexuality, which is a sacred thing. So it's one of the holy things. I just did a wonderful wedding yesterday. Uh, all stops polled. It was the it was a solemn high nuptial mass with with you know like ten priests, three priests on the sanctuary, and there's no doubt that matrimony that is the business of making ba making babies right that's matri it's about mother matri matrimony from motherhood is sacred, and to mock it as they did in that tableau. Not only mocking the Eucharist, but mocking marriage. In today's ordinary form reading, it's Saint John the Baptist that is described as um, getting his head cut off because he, de he he insisted that the marriage bed be respected. It is not right for you to have your brother Philip's wife. The, the, the greatest man and woman born died for sexuality died for purity. And that's precisely what they were doing. So, and the Eucharist is the flesh of Christ. It's a very, it's a carnal reality. 
and the Eucharist, of course, um, is represented by matrimony. That's Paul says the great mystery of the church or the bride and the bridegroom. So all of those things were in play. All of those things were mocked in this opening ceremony quite precisely and quite intentionally. Well, I have a question, though, about, I guess you say it's always wrong to mock a person, but not necessarily to offend someone. And you use as examples when you're saying the, you know, the Olympic organizers didn't or aren't going to mock some of these ridiculous ideas that are out there, um, you know, gender equity or whatever it was. But aren't some of those ideas, I just call them ridiculous, aren't they, in, shouldn't they be mocked? Not necessarily people who hold those beliefs, but shouldn't the ideas themselves be mocked? Because that's sometimes the most powerful weapon to point out how wrong they are, is through mockery. Mockery as correction, is what you're saying. Because they certainly need to be corrected, those false ideas. Should they be lampooned? Um, I don't know if you, anybody looks at the Babylon Bee. Every once in a while, somebody sends me a link to Babylon Bee is kind of the gold standard for mocking woke culture, lampooning it, exposing its ridiculousness. And uh, certainly on a secular level, I, there's a real value to satire, but it's important to not satirize a person needlessly or uh, gratuitously, not to forget that this person is made in the image of God. One of the uh, podcasts on this subject of the Olympics was uh, Matt Pratt, I think it was, um, interviewed an exorcist, a priest who's an exorcist. And maybe it was, I'm not sure who it was. I, I saw just a clip the other day, but don't want to get this wrong. But the, the exorcists focused on the souls of the people in that tableau and the people behind it, not the offense and not the reaction wasn't, well, we have to expose how ridiculous this is, how much an error, but his real heartfelt concern was with the souls of those people. Now, for a man that deals with the, the satanic day in and day out, it's very clear to him that what's really at stake here are souls, the souls of the blasphemers who are going to hell if they don't repent. And I, that always has to be front in our minds if we use satire or mockery against false ideas. I think it'd be very dangerous, perhaps, uh, just plain inappropriate for a priest or a bishop to use mockery. That's why I say in a secular sense, maybe satire, uh, yeah, satire has a value, but um, priests, now I, I do it sometimes and I, I regret it. So I think um, in the, the best impulse of a Christian heart is not to, to satirize even, but to firmly correct. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think... Uh, firm and charitable correction yeah, even is more more effective than than satire in the long run. Yeah, I wonder though if if the satire could be used. I mean, I I don't even know exactly. Well, I'm sure the Babylon Bee managed to make satire of whatever happened at the Olympics, but not even so much to mock something like that, or or but to mock more of the ridiculous these philosophies that are out there and prevent people from falling into it. Um, you won't necessarily pull someone out of that error through the mockery, but you could you could steer people away from it. Possibly, I mean, not necessarily you as a priest, but satire and mockery um, that might be a good way to save people from it ahead of time. Uh, but I did yes, have another. I agree. Okay, I did have another question. You briefly touched on the Eucharistic Congress. I don't know if you were there or got reports from it, but what do you think are some ways? both to uh, make reparation for what happened at the Olympics or even more specifically for people, how can lay people encourage reverence for the Eucharist in their parishes or encourage their pastor to encourage more reverence? Well, the first thing is Eucharistic adoration. It's in too few parishes. Ideally, every parish should have adorations 
many hours a week and, and many parishes that have 24 hour adoration. So do a holy hour, do a holy half hour. Come before the Blessed Sacrament on your knees and that's just a you know, in, the, in the tabernacle or in the monstrance if you don't have an exposition. And pray the prayer that Our Lady of Fatima taught the children that um, asks reparation and makes atonement for sacrilege and blasphemy. I think we should, lay people must not tire of calling their priests to provide them with Eucharistic adoration and reverent masses and Eucharistic devotion, such as benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. Because priests, we priests are lazy. Why? Because we're men. Uh, <laughs> men are naturally lazy. I think of the California Indians when the Padres got here, all the California Indian, the men were all laying around naked, just sleeping and eating. And the women were doing all the work and they were wearing clothes. They were wearing the pants of the family. But that's kind of what's happened in the Western world. The men have become passive and lazy, given into their natural laziness. Well, all priests are males, at least in the Catholic Church. And, you know, you say the, the problem with the priestly scandals, crisis, that's, that's, that's horrible stuff. But, you know, it begins with laziness. I think the more pervasive problem among the priesthood is simple laziness. Priests who work mm -hmm. two or three hours, four hours a day maybe, and, and don't do anything after that. Priests who have one or two masses assigned to them a week because the parishes don't have many daily masses. So if we could get our priests to work harder, because it does take work to, to maintain Eucharistic adoration. We have it here in the parish and, and it takes a lot of attendance. We have, I have to attend to it a lot when the other priest. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here and maybe expressing my frustration, but um, lay people should attend to Eucharistic adoration and get their priests to do so if at all possible, to make reparation. Okay. Can I just say one more thing? Yes. I think we're at 12 minutes here, but um, I was just talking with a journalist today about COVID. He wants to you know, maybe write a little bit about reflections about what happened two or three years ago with the masses shut down. And what happened was, among other things, the bishops almost wholesale gave a dispensation from the mass, from the Holy Eucharist. And they didn't need to because people already had a dispensation if there was a risk of contagion or of serious illness. But what happened and the government wanted the bishops to do that, to, to, you know, to meet their own agenda. So what happened was, essentially, the bishops said, the Eucharist is not that important. It's not source and summit. The source and summit is safety, is your own personal. Now, that's harsh, OK? And any person saying, well, Father Ilo said this about the bishops, of course, the bishops would have a response and, and you know, to the, they, they are I'm not a bishop, so I don't know what they were facing. But the message on our end was the mass is not the source and summit of your life. And now we're trying to make, you know, we're spending a lot of time and money trying to make up for that with the Eucharistic revival, which is laudable. But the train's already left the station. We have heard from our clergy that the Eucharist is not the most important thing in your life. It's food and safety. So... We have to come back to the most important thing in your life is the Holy Eucharist. And anybody that mocks it needs to be firmly corrected. That is, every priest should sit, make that clear in their pulpit this Sunday because of what happened last week. I mean, maybe if I were a bishop, I would, I would put out a pastoral letter. I want this read at every pulpit this weekend, that what happened was unacceptable with this mockery of the Eucharist. So those are... Um, those are some things I think our bishops and our priests can do and our lay people can encourage us to do. Yeah, I, I mean, I was even thinking of more just if people received on the tongue again or received, like, use the altar rail again. Because if people are going up to communion and, you know, back slapping each other, you know, carrying on the yeah. kiss of peace in substance in the, you know, it really isn't that big of a deal. It's just a time to get up and stretch your legs. Um, they wouldn't understand yes. why it's a big deal. That is true. 
thank you for pointing that out. It's the reverence with which the understanding with which we celebrate the Holy Eucharist that sets the tone for all of our uh, parish life and our, our, our family life. So along with adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, it's the reform of the liturgy, the reform that never really happened to make the liturgy more um, a deeper surrender of will to the Almighty in the Holy, Holy Mass.